ready to get started. I think that's, that's great to see beautiful slides. So it is my great <coughs> honor, pleasure, to introduce Rochi Joan Halifax, who is a, a dear friend and teacher and just a all around wonderful wo woman. Uh, many of you know her. She is a world renowned Zen Buddhist teacher and is the founder and head abbot of Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Roshi started her career as a medical anthropologist. She has a PhD in medical anthropology. She was on faculty at the University of Miami School of Medicine and has been a visiting scholar at numerous universities around the world. Has been here to UVA before and wonderful to have her back again. She's been a scholar at the Library of Congress and has been really active in a large way in socially engaged Buddhism. And just two, two areas that I know that she's put a tremendous amount of time and effort. One is with the um, prisoners and also in the area of contemplative end of life care. And that's how I got to, to know Roshi. She has this wonderful program called the Being with Dying program that there have been hundreds and hundreds of um, healthcare professionals that have participated in this contemplative end of life care training, including about 60 people here from UVA who have been through that program. So it's just a, a delight to have her here for the next few days. And she's going to speak with us today on a topic called Cultivating Compassion in the Cl Clinician-Patient Interaction, a Model and an Intervention. Roshi. Thank you so much, I was saying to John Shorling that, um, Dr. Shorling, that it's uh, wonderful to be in Charlottesville. I went to prep school at uh, Stuart Hall in Stanton, Virginia. So I'm, my long-term memory gets very activated here. It's very long-term. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's the dogwood, the smell in the air, the uh, Jeffersonian architecture. It's just a great pleasure. I also want to acknowledge the support of John and Tootsie Kluge, who um, uh, were very instrumental in funding work that we've done at UPIA and that I've done in other places. And also uh, Dory. Our wonderful boy, Dean of the School of Nursing. So, as Susan mentioned, um, I've been in this end of life care field since 1970. And before that, in the mid 60s, I began to practice meditation. I, I'm 70, by the way, just to put it in context. Um, I didn't start meditation until I was 10, so I'm 20. <laughs> my, well, I was in my early 20s. And um, I didn't really uh, know that the, there would be a, a vital confluence in some streams that uh, now are, in my uh, dotage, becoming uh, a kind of big river. And um, that big river entails uh, the following things. It entails the experience of meditation, where um, we actually train our minds. And uh, with that, uh, the body is being trained because you can't separate the mind and the body. The second is engaged practice or engaged Buddhism. And that is to say that um, our Buddhism is not just on the cushion, but it's how we apply it in the world to really be of service to others. Another stream that opened up for me is the area of neuroscience, which uh, was somewhat interesting to me during the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, Joe, the work of Joe Camilla and other early uh, neuroscientists, but that came into focus around a good friendship, long friendship I had with Francisco Varela, who was a Buddhist practitioner, really renowned neuroscientist, and also a philosopher of, uh, of his own kind, and an extraordinarily uh, innovative thinker. And these streams have uh, come into another level of engagement for me in working in the end-of-life care field where I have seen, uh, been witness to the suffering of many clinicians. Mostly we're concentrating on the patient experience or the experience of uh, family members. But, um, uh, and that was 
my main work for many, many years was, was uh, direct care as, you know, in my role, whatever that means, to uh, people who are dying and also to uh, family members and friends. But also since the early 70s, I've had the opportunity to interact with now thousands upon thousands of clinicians in this field. Um, not always as a trainer, but um, sometimes as a teacher, sometimes as a colleague and ally. And what I recognize very clearly is that um, there's something happening in the life of many clinicians which should not be happening. And we could call it a, a deficit and what the downstream effects of this deficit uh, entail, and that is a deficit of compassion. And yet the word compassion for me, uh, I, I'm a very pragmatic person. So it's, I, you know, I'm not romantic, I'm not conventionally religious, um, uh, I don't operate really in the sense of, you know, the usual person in my role uh, with a big sort of feeling of faith or even devotion. So you'll excuse me, I'm just kind of a plain rice Buddhist. Um, I'm very, I'm just interested, frankly, from my own point of view in finding ways to um, make uh, what has been very uh, useful for me as a practitioner relevant in the clinical context. And so apropos of that, um, I'm even hesitant to use the word <laughs> compassion. It's a really important word in Buddhism. It's a very important word in Christianity and in other spiritual traditions, but it's a little um, ill-defined if you're uh, more pragmatically oriented. And it's not very well understood, certainly among clinicians. And in fact, uh, compassion is looked on as something that could actually, if you engage in it, perhaps harm you if you're a clinician. So um, that's an interesting conundrum. This is the, you know, the kind of puzzle that I enjoy. Because as a practitioner and as someone who's worked in this field, I've been just absolutely fascinated with the process of what we call compassion from my own subjective experience or when I've encountered clinicians who have the characteristic of the process of compassion engaged. And I'm also very interested in what happens when compassion isn't present, not only in the life of patients, but also in the life of the clinician. So um, thanks to uh, John Kluge, I was uh, able to go to the Library of Congress and to sit in an office where I had no responsibility for uh, a period of time. It was just wonderful. You know, it's, you know, back in my own place where if I'm traveling around, I have, I'm really busy. I'm like a busy contemplative. I'm sure some of you know what that's like. But there I was com in this completely unstructured situation. And I decided to put my thinking and feeling and sensing toward this issue of compassion because again, as an individual in the field of a lot of suffering, including my work in the penitentiary of New Mexico, in this you know, death row and maximum security, or work in the Himalayas with indigenous people who don't have access to uh, conventional health care. It, it's just been a very important subject, but I, I realized, you know, I've been in this end of life care training field for a long time, but I don't think you can really train people in compassion. So this goes, you know, this is kind of irritating for people. Um, but as I began to uh, untease this uh, process that we call compassion, to um, unpack it, to uh, uh, un undo some of the threads, I recognize that something that seems obvious in retrospect, that compassion is actually comprised of non-compassion elements. And what are those elements? And what I want to do, because I think this uh, perspective will change training protocols in uh, how we approach uh, clinicians and other people in educating them how to prime or how to nourish <coughs> compassion. So um, let's just take a, a little journey into this. Let's hope I can do this right. Yeah. You know, and the other thing I want to say is that my life is nothing but one long collaboration. It's all about relationship, and I just want to acknowledge some of my colleagues, including Dr. Tony Back, Susan Bauer-Boots, and the Rushton, 
Gary Pasternak, Donna Quillos, uh, Mary Taylor, the late Ted Heffernan and others who have been part of the group that has um, really contributed so much to our Being the Dying training program. And also to a great raft of neuroscientists as I was involved with uh, the Mind and Life Institute since its very onset. Uh, this has been a, a, a wonderful journey for me. I, I continue with that collaboration uh, with Mind and Life, not only as a board member, but also as a moderator and presenter. And the work that um, these neuroscientists have done in the area of contemplative neuroscience um, is really the base of uh, my own work in this, uh, the development of this model of compassion. And of course the Kluge's and others. So um, the first thing that I felt some years ago that I had to do was to really look at um, what are some of the obstacles, the internal or interpersonal or, or institutional obstacles that clinicians in this field face? And instead of calling them problems, I've actually characterized these uh, experiences as edge states. And um, here we have our what uh, I have delineated as these six edge states. These are uh, processes that clinicians uh, find themselves in in the process, not every clinician, nor are they subject to every six, all six of these edge states, but they are processes that actually uh, uh, deeply affect many clinicians. And the, the first one being what Michael McGrath has called pathological altruism. And I, I think this is a quite useful um, designation. And in fact, it primes uh, subsequent uh, edge states. But it's when um, the desire to engage in helping others is actually damaging to oneself, either psychologically or physically, which is uh, not an uncommon uh, experience. In fact, we have a young um, medical student at uh, my Zen center. I was in a conversation with uh, day before yesterday. I said, well, why did you uh, take a leave from medical school? And he said, it was so stressful. It was harming me. It was harming the people in my class. I just didn't feel that uh, my reason for going into medicine could be fulfilled from this kind of training experience. The second being uh, vital exhaustion, or more commonly known as burnout, and this is when the demands of the institution uh, really make it uh, difficult for you to sustain uh, vitality and viability, and where you're weighed down by the cumulative demands of the work environment. Uh, the third is called vicarious or secondary trauma, and this is when one is exposed to a lot of suffering and develops sensitivity uh, around that suffering that is similar to post-traumatic stress syndrome. The fourth is moral distress, and that is uh, anger or outrage that's actually provoked by a real or perceived violation of an ethical standard, such as fairness, respect, or beneficence. And apropos of this, uh, Dr. Sinha Rushton, who has the bunting chair at Hopkins, and I are really close friends and colleagues, and we're just finishing uh, two papers with Al Kazniak and Moral Distress that I think are going to be very important uh, papers in the field. Uh, the fifth is horizontal uh, and vertical hostility, and this is basically uh, treating one's colleagues, either a nurse treating uh, a social worker, a doctor treating a nurse, that'd be uh, vertical hostility or horizontal hostility, where nurses are disrespecting each other or doctors are disrespecting each other, and you know, uh, actions that we would call bullying. And the sixth one is called structural violence, and this is basically systemic uh, discrimination or systemic violence, where the policies and procedures at institutions whether it's government or medical or educational uh, or religious, um, cause harm to an individual or a group that uh, comes from uh, a stream other than the so-called mainstream. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, uh, I, went, I uh, taught at the University of Miami School of Medicine. I was a medical anthropologist there uh, in 1970, 71, 72. And um, so it's great to go back uh, years later and do my thing. 
And um, I was talking about this issue around structural violence. And so uh, the head of the epidemiology said, you know, we just um, uh, adjudicated a situation and set policy around a situation uh, related to structural violence. And we're actually really proud of that. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, well, um, an older uh, gay couple, two women, one of the partners had a massive stroke, was put in the ICU, and her partner was not allowed to see her. Um, the afflicted, uh, the woman with the stroke died, and the surviving partner was outraged. And she held the university accountable and forced us to change our policies in relation to domestic partnerships and ac patient accessibility. So that is you know, a very uh, deep case of structural violence. We see this around race and diagnosis and many, many different issues. So th this is just some of the things that uh, clinicians face. And then uh, I've designated what I call the six futilities, including patient demands, which clinicians feel they just cannot meet, the demands of the institution, errors in communication and treatment, a feeling, just a subjective feeling of uh, inadequacy, not being able to, you know, help somebody. Uh, the sense of work really not benefiting patients and the ongoing perception of suffering. But, a diamond is just a piece of charcoal that handles stress exceptionally well. So let's look at um, a little bit about uh, what this kind of capacity means that we call compassion and how we can prime compassion. And let me just say, um, without having had uh, a practice that came from the East uh, from 1965 up into 2013, so that's a, you know, a few years of uh, exploring this, um, I, I, I'm very grateful to be in the body of a Western woman, frankly. Uh, that feels like uh, maybe in a previous lifetime uh, I did a little bit of good so that I could enjoy the privilege of being in this particular situation. At the same time, um, as someone who was born and raised into a uh, religious Christian home, but who became a cross-cultural anthropologist and a medical anthropologist, I really look um, within many traditions for uh, ways wherein my own mind and heart could be cultivated. And part of this was primed by um, being uh, in the 20s during the 1960s, during the civil rights and the anti-war movement, when we were very uh, socially engaged, but also very, very polarized. I wanted to develop the kind of uh, stability, resiliency, resiliency, clarity, and also kindness and compassion that would make me a, a, a better person in addressing uh, social issues of that era and, and throughout time. So Buddhism gave me something that my own Christianity gave me to a certain extent, but it, I was really interested in how to train the mind. How do you actually create the conditions? And this was talked about in the earlier presentation around addiction. It's not just taking a magic pill. It's not even you know, being able to change the social context. But it's the capacity we have to literally transform our own mental continuum and mental structure. And here we are in the School of Architecture, and I often talk about mental architecture. Mm. It's changing the architecture of our own mind. So let's look just very simply at uh, the distinction between empathy and compassion, because these are often conflated. And so we know that empathy is an important element uh, in compassion. It's a step, one step or one balance in uh, a complex system that uh, involves attention, affect, cognitive responses, and so forth. But empathy is not compassion. And there's an important distinction that we have to make between empathy and compassion. And in the most simple way, we could say that empathy is feeling with. It is affective resonance. It is sensing into uh, the experience of another. And compassion, uh, as 
I, I think George Prusas, uh, my Greek colleague who's an endocrinologist uh, who was at the Library of Congress, who uh, actually sort of made these uh, finer linguistic points, he says, you know, compassion is really feeling for another. And it's not necessarily isomorphic to the sufferer's affective state. And it's also characterized by the aspiration to help. So how do we train people in compassion? I mean, that's kind of a conundrum. My own contention is that um, you can't just jump people into compassion. And this is how clinicians, when the issue of compassion comes up, are usually trained. Of course I'm listening to your expression of spiritual suffering. Don't you see me making eye contact, striking an open posture, leaning towards you, and nodding empathically. <laughs> so this is the kind of outward in the behavioral dimensions uh, that are uh, trained into clinicians, often trained into clinicians. But there's another approach to compassion. And I, I want to just take you through a few little steps in this um, di discovery process. And again, you know, I can be completely wrong. I, I love to be wrong, because that means I get to learn something new. So I'm sitting in this meeting with Tanya Singer and Dalai Lama and Richie Davidson and Matthew Ricard and Joseph Goldstein and Mishi John. It's a small meeting at the University of Michigan. And we're looking at what are the important research questions around compassion. And uh, Tanya made this uh, note, and it really caught my attention. And the note was, uh, she pointed out that she had been doing research on people suffering from alexithymia, which is an autism-related <coughs> disorder. And that disorder has two very distinct, among other, but two very important characteristics for the point of what we're addressing here. And that is people who suffer from alexithymia have a very low capacity for interoceptivity. In other words, it's very difficult for people with alexithymia to actually read their own visceral processes. Now, I think the Buddha had a really good point, those of you who are Buddhists, when he made the first foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of the body. I think Johnny really did the right thing when he emphasized the body scan. Because embodiment is really a critical feature in the experience of compassion. And we'll see a little bit more how that works uh, shortly. But when Tanya said this, I, I had this big kind of, you know, it was like a big balloon over my head and an exclamation point with a sort of wow and another exclamation point. Because I immediately was respected and recognized how uh, many clinicians I've encountered and worked with who are very dissociated from their physical experience. How much obesity there is uh, among nurses. How many uh, uh, doctors are actually uh, in the addiction complex, taking drugs which basically dissociate, or substances which dissociate them from their body. And. Um, then Tanya went on to uh, share that one of the things that uh, she discovered is that the same neural networks are activated in the experience of interoceptivity as in the experience of empathy. That your own capacity to really sense into your physical experience, that it, in your own subjective sense, mirrors your capacity to sense into the experience of another. And I was like, that's really fascinating. And it, we just, I immediately plugged it into our training program, into our curriculum. It really lit my fire. I went, gosh, clinicians are taking other people's pulses. Now there's machines doing it. Let's help clinicians learn how to take their own pulses. And then mindfulness of breathing, and so on and so forth. So this was a very important uh, little neuroscience piece for, for my own thinking in this. And, um, you know, all itineraries are subject to reality, so I'm very happy to, to uh, have uh, all of this change. But what I recognized, you know, in my own very simple way, 
is that interceptivity and fundamental embodiment actually prides an individual's capacity for empathy. And that uh, empathy, interceptivity, empathy, plus positive regard, that is a sense of prosociality, a sense of uh, fundamental caring about the well-being of others, combined with insight, primes or conduces to compassion. So uh, this is my little, you know, sort of first model. And uh, this affected how we train people in our big training program at UPI. But then, as I was sitting at the medical, uh, or at the Library of Congress, I began to kind of pull things apart a little bit more. Um, one was, uh, there's some people who are very naturally uh, receptive, interceptive, uh, and have this kind of natural compassion. But when, as this medical student said to me day before yesterday, um, compassion, empathy, caring about other is, others is a little bit driven out of you in medical and nursing training, how do we re-engage it? How do we train people? And also, how do we train educators? And what I did was then, um, I looked at uh, the elements that I recognized from this big field of contemplative neuroscience that um, we were beginning to map out, to neural mapping, and to recognize the value of certain qualities. And I began to think, well, can there be, for example, compassion without attention, attentional balance? Can you be a compassionate person and, and be distracted, for example? We talked, we heard something about distraction earlier. Or disperse. Um, can you be a compassionate person uh, without uh, affective balance? And I, I mean balance, not just prosociality, um, but also uh, to uh, be both prosocial and also equanimous. I don't think so, I said to myself as I'm sitting in my little office in DC. And then I began to go into some of the cognitive dimensions. And I said, well, can you be compassionate without an intention which is basically altruistic? I mean, can you actualize concern for others without really wanting to? Would you need to have some level of uh, ethical engagement or vow or sense of uh, deep motivation? I don't think so, I said to myself. And I just, again, going back through these uh, many years of work in this field and reflecting upon uh, the, this, this, uh, these questions, and then I asked myself, well, can you be compassionate without some level of cognitive engagement? And I began to, and I'll unpack this for you, to really <coughs> tease apart some of the cognitive dimensions that um, prime compassion. And when you see those uh, elements, you'll understand. And I went, no. And then I said, can you be compassionate um, with uh, being dissociated from the body and without engaging? And I said, I don't think so. So um, I began to play with these elements and developed three axes, the AA axis, the II, and the EE. <laughs> OK, thank you. And the, uh, I just got my time check, so we will go on. And what I realized, and I'm going to take you to show you this, that this is basically uh, a process, compassion is a, a, a principle of compassion, is an emergent process arising as a result of the interaction between elements of a complex adaptive system. It's nonlinear. And let's just look in a linear way at some of these elements. And by the way, there's several papers published on this in journals, so I'll send them to Susan and she can make them available because I'm steaming through this. Um, recently, I had a wonderful uh, encounter at the Summer Research Institute with Rebecca Todd, presenting some various, very interesting research on the relationship between attention and affect, and that affect biases attention. I won't say more about that, except that somehow, you know, it's like, again, 
I put those axes together. It was a sort of intuitive thing. And then Rebecca said, yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, that uh, what we discover is that um, attention is modified uh, in uh, considerable ways by our uh, affective uh, content. And that, in fact, that's all right. <laughs> If it's a patient, you're free to go. Thank you. <laughs> it's my wife. <laughs> you're free to do what you feel serves. <laughs> She's compassionate. <laughs> so one of the things about attention is that it's very important to have uh, the quality of attention that is characterized by clarity, that's enduring, that's more, more than just uh, a moment, um, where there's high resolution and that's robust in order to actually perceive what's out there. And in our uh, uh, psychosocial world that we live in now, where there's high distraction, um, it's often very difficult to, for us to actually perceive suffering uh, accurately. Another is that, um, uh, the, as I said, interceptivity uh, actually primes empathy, and that is uh, effective balance is really critical uh, in our experience of compassion because um, if we become so aroused empathically, we go into what's now called empathic distress. We go into uh, states that are fundamentally deleterious. Just to go now quickly into the cognitive uh, dimension, and these streams, again, are all interrelated. I just unpack them because this is actually for training purposes. It's important to parse finally when you're developing training programs. Uh, the first is uh, on the cognitive level, but it also is affective as well, and that is intention, that there's an ethical base, an unselfish pro-social motivation to trans transform suffering. And then we move into uh, insight, and that is, uh, insight is really important because we need mental pliancy. We need to be able, when we're in the midst of uh, suffering of patients or families or colleagues, to have a metacognitive perspective. Um, and that pliancy is, is um, uh, based on, also as well, on our experience of self-awareness, including memory, and the ability to actually downregulate. In other words, we can feel somatically, uh, when you were talking about sympathetic arousal, you can have the somatic experience of arousal, you can go, ah, oh, that's my mindfulness bell. Time to take an in-breath. Time to uh, actually apply uh, antidotes for down-regulation. And then perspective taking is also important, our ability to actually see through the eyes of the other how other people perceive the world. But one that is very difficult for most people to re resonate with is the capacity to actually distinguish self from other. And um, this is, again, comes out of research in social psychology, uh, the work of Batson and Eisenberg, just you know, quickly, parenthetically. Mostly, you know, when you're talking to clinicians, the greatest fear is this fear of merging, of loss of boundary, and then uh, upregulation and personal distress. And so that the metacognitive perspective allows individuals to actually recognize, as you're sitting there with the patient, I feel this person's pain, and I'm not this person. Very important a distinction. Again, to the cultivation of moral ground, that our work is based on a moral imperative, the development of moral sensitivity, and the development of moral character. And then the conceptual recognition of the truth of impermanence, interconnectedness, all beings want to be happy. And then finally, um, the, probably the next to the most difficult thing is to have uh, the kind of equanimity in this experience of compassion that allows you not to be attached to outcomes. So you're, ha you're actually working with two balances, like two sides of the same coin. You know, one side is that you're very, uh, you're working toward the best outcome possible. But on the other side of the coin is you can't be attached to outcomes. And because when you're driving for an outcome like a good death, you can really uh, harm patients. 
you want to do the best you can to alleviate suffering, create the best conditions uh, possible. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, this has to do with the avoidance of futility. And then finally, that the physical axis gives rise to what uh, Aristotle was called a BK or a principle to action, which conduces to equanimity and eudaimonia, and it's grounded, and there's readiness to act and potential action. So this is called the Avada model. Attention and affect mm -hmm. conduce to balance. Intention and insight conduce to discernment. If there's embodiment and there's ethical and active engagement conducing to equanimity and eudaimonia. Huh, huh? Helps you remember. This is a, another, uh, this is in a paper that's coming out of Max Planck, so I don't have a good uh, Max Planck uh, publication in July, but uh, this just gives you a feel for the nonlinear aspect. And then finally, uh, uh, on Monday, is it Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday, I'm taking this model. The model uh, has uh, created a very different training protocol in um, our training program of clinicians, but also um, it's being picked up in many places because it's you know teaching people uh, these discrete um, balances which uh, actually combine to give rise to compassion. And then I wanted a little back pocket something, some uh, uh, process that clinicians, but actually I did this, if you can believe it, in Japan for clinicians and educators. And you know, it's not, it's kanji, I mean, I mean it's Japanese, so, but they really got the English. Um, and that was this model called GRACE, or process called GRACE. And um, it is uh, using this model as a base, but it is uh, gathering attention, recalling intention, attuning to self, attuning to other, considering what will really serve, engaging, and then ending. And so uh, I, that's why I said I like your sober um, <laughs> mnemonic. This is another mnemonic that um, uh, many clinicians have actually picked up on. Um, and then we have training components uh, for each of these uh, elements in the grace process. And finally, um, Upaya is this kind of hotbed of uh, new ideas and in many different streams, engage Buddhism and leadership in chaplaincy, uh, which is systems-based. And so some of our programs in the end-of-life care field include one being led by your wonderful Susan Bauer Wu, and I, uh, uh, Tom, Clarity and Compassion in the Storm of Healthcare and Illness, the Being with Dying training program, which is completely oversubscribed year after year. So if you're interested, let us know now or next year. And then the GRACE training that Dr. Tony Back and Sundar Rushton and I will be teaching in September. So thank you so very, very much, Susan and David and all of you. And okay. I know we're not really following the clock right now. <laughs> Do we have time? I'm looking at you, John. Do we have time for a couple questions? Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments? Like, I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm just completely flat. So upregulated is a state of excitation, psychophysical excitation. And to downregulate, this is just, you know, how we characterize it, you know, our little mind and life and your pie circle, is to actually modulate your affective response, which sometimes, you know, for those people who are uh, very healthy mentally, you're able to, uh, it, you spontaneously modulate. But for people who are in high stress environments, who go into states of upregulation, then it's applying uh, antidotes to calm down. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. One yeah. yeah. more question? Yeah, I, another terminological question. Uh, this is, I've never seen this term before, alexithemia. If it's what you say it is, of impaired compassion, that would apply to almost everybody, but is it a more specific? No, no. alexithymia is an autism-related disorder. 
that um, uh, where an individual, for example, has to know when they're hungry, when they have to go to the bathroom, or all of these kind of uh, visceral ex experiences that shape our lives. Sexual feelings that are arising, uh, sense of nervousness, the felt pulse or felt sense spectrum, and so on. Being completely out of touch with what's going on inside of them. That's yep. exact, at, at the physiological level. Right. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. John. Um, I just wondered if you could comment a little more. I touched on this in my talk, but on the, the thought, on this combined capacity for increased interoceptivity of, uh, of paying more attention to what's going on inside us and the ability for metacognition or to see it and not lead to um, upregulation, increased distress. So that, that this combines both of them. On the one hand, just paying attention more to internal processes might lead to uh, more distress, and yet right. the ability to see it as what's arising in the present moment and, and not re react to it. And I think that the work that uh, you do in, in terms of MBSR, the whole mindfulness continuum, um, one of the things that uh, arises in, you know, in the best of circumstances, there's no uh, fancy, <laughs> Buddha knows and we know, but that um, it's more uh, it's easier to step aside from your experience, not lay heavy judgments, but to notice what's going on. And the real process of mindfulness is this experience it, of noticing. And that, that's what I mean by a metacognitive perspective. And, you know, usually we're in a complex, as Mary Louise von Franz will talk about, you have fallen into a complex. And um, here, you, you actually step out of the complex. You extract. You do a mental or cognitive extraction. And then you're able to actually shift your perspective on what's happening. And I, I'll give an example. So I've got, you know, a patient's family. Uh, she's actually, she died at 11 o'clock this morning. I'm thinking very specifically somebody, you know, a particular situation. The husband is extremely uh, sensitive, brilliant, Santa Fe Institute person, and is um, completely upregulated, if we want to call it that. Exactly. Now, how to help him actually have perspective on the fact that he's swamping his wife's experience, but at the same time, he's in anticipatory grief. And to look at also me desperately wanting to, both desperately wanting to help both of them, and how do I get the desperation out of there and create a context where there's more groundedness and clarity. So it's a metacognitive perspective that allows me to actually look at my momentary upregulation to calm my beams down <laughs> and then to set a field for uh, more grounded and sensitive interaction yeah like that but that's you know it's years of training some people do it naturally thank you again this was wonderful it just made me think sitting here and listening to you answer this question there was research a long time ago, and I don't remember the specifics, but on um, preventing burnout and developing compassion and effectiveness in healthcare providers, um, airline attendants, and wait staff, because they all sort of have similar difficulties. And along the lines of the metacognition, what they found was that the uh, people who had sort of an innate ability that they call to act, but it's really sort of this the stepping back, like you just said, um, to gain that, that metacognitive position. Um, it was fascinating. So I just wondered if you'd ever thought about that, that, you know, uh, but they qualified it as, you know, if you uh, have this good ability at acting um, and this, these other components that are sort of comparable to what you're talking about, um, that really helped. It, and it just, it just was an interesting so when you say act, you mean performative or do no, you mean, no, uh, that, uh, sort of step engage. outside themselves. Oh, yeah. Step outside. Yeah, yeah. I to, think that's really yeah. critical. Yeah. That has to do with insight. Right. Yeah, and uh, again, um, you know, meditation in the best of circumstances uh, allows that to happen. There's a longer refractory, what's called refractory period. There's a good pause uh, before the damage goes down, and you can modify your behavior should you get triggered. <laughs> we'll take one more question. Uh, 
Um, thank you for, for bringing yourself here to this space um, now. I'm a first year medical student and um, I've had kind of a winding path to get here. I'm 28 years old and um, I feel very fortunate to be at the University of Virginia, you know, this year right now, what's going, what's going on with the Contemplative Sciences Center and at this very moment um, here with you. Uh, thank you for, you know, for all of the work you've done. I, um, I have a question about the compassion being beaten out of uh, nursing students and medical students um, and different folks. And I think that um, fellow medical students are uniquely positioned uh, to help to help protect each other. Um, and I, I'm actually very concerned about, um, even with great models like this, that there could be, could be permanent damage done um, during the training, not only the four years, but then the residency as well. And um, I guess my question for you would be, uh, what advice would you give to, to a, a first year medical student um, who's got, got three and a half years to go and is then gonna be a resident um, in terms of uh, I guess taking advantage of that unique position and um, doing what one can to sort of tend the garden while also, you know, tending oneself. So I'm going to ask you, and I think there are other people in this room who um, uh, have some sense of that, but what does your intuition tell you? Um, the comment you made about the dogwoods um, reminded me of my aunt, um, who's a uh, children's book author um, in, Eng in England. She was a tutor at Oxford, and she came and I told her that you know sometimes I feel overwhelmed by just sitting in the classroom and seeing these different forms of suffering of my classmates. You know, you can just see it on their faces, and you know what's happening at home and in their personal lives. And and she said, um, try to attend to to who's present in the moment, in every moment. And that includes ourselves always, if we're by ourselves or if we're in a group of 10 people. And it also includes everyone's, everyone that's there, but it doesn't include the people that aren't in that moment. And so that kind of is empowering to go one moment at a time, one person at a time, and, um, and not sort of get, get overwhelmed. That's my intuition, but I, I thought I'd ask you. <laughs> well, I, I would say cultivate your inner aunt. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's... She's your resource. She's your the voice of wisdom and sanity and love and kindness inside of you, and that's in you. And I, I mean, that's it's not something you acquire like you know acquiring money or prestige. It's actually something that's not already there for you. <laughs> so the way that we you know some of us have cultivated this. There there you know a couple of. Uh, interrelated things. One is by having a steady practice, having a, a, a way that you resource yourself, you know, that you, you know, your refresh button. Uh, two is to develop um, interpersonal resources. Relationship is really critical, and not just with your uh, co-medical students, the nursing students, but that you have buoyant uh, relationships. And the third we heard uh, in the questions, and that is the value of the natural that um, you allow the dogwood to be your ally and what you need. The Buddha sat under a Bodhi tree, not in a temple. Enjoy. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody.